Hey, Sonic Graver here. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to another sci-fi topic. I wanted to talk to you today about maybe a writing tip that I had learned from this wonderful novella by Frederick Pohl. This story is called The Midas Plague. And what Frederick Pohl did with this story was that he crafted the opposite of what we know to be true or how we perceive things, and he made it believable. And I wanted to present that to you today, whether you're into science fiction writing or some fantasy writing. I think it can be true for both genres. You know, um, whether you are writing for an alien world that, you know, your protagonist is trying to understand, or maybe it's a human race that lives in a very absurd world that we're not used to. And so let's talk about how to make the opposite of what is true and how to make that believable. So without further ado, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and give you some context. Uh, I'm going to set up the scene for you. And I won't be giving you spoilers. I'm not going to really be talking too much about the plot. Um, but uh, again, I highly recommend the read The Midas Plague. And so here we go. <laughs> so this story starts with a married couple, a newly married couple. And it's a very extravagant wedding. And the couple is um, quite young and they're very, very much in love and they're very happy. And so we see this very lavish celebration and a lot of drinks, a lot of food, a lot of really, really nice gifts, a lot of really expensive gifts. And pretty much before we know it, the, the, the couple is whisked off to their new home, or at least the, the man's home, uh, this wonderful mansion of 28 rooms. And um, the man's name is Maury, and Maury, the name, is very indicative of, of the plot itself, I think. And his wife is named Cherry. And Cherry's parents like Maury. They, they do like Maury. Um, but they think something is going to be a little um, hard. Uh, they, they think uh, while they like him as, as a nice young man, they think that there's going to be trouble brewing in, in the future. And we do actually see that tension in, in a couple of pages. But before we get into the actual tension of the book, uh, we, we see that the, the man, Maury, um, is... Um, you know, just lavishing upon his new wife with all these gifts and, and new furniture and, and jewelry. And, and, and he, he's showering her with things in the supermarket. And then there's one point in the exchange where we're thinking, OK, the reader's thinking, oh, this, this man is really well off. He's got, a, he's got a mansion and all that. And he's giving his wife just all these really nice things as, as a young man in love would give to his, his bride. And and there's one point where he's showing her, I think it was a diamond necklace or maybe a ruby necklace. And she kind of looks at him qu quizzically and says, Maury, do, do I need another one of those? And he kind of is, is taken aback by this. And he's like, no, no, you, you, you don't need it. And she's just really just, oh, my, you really do love me. And, and so this, this is a very weird exchange. OK, so she doesn't want another one of these things. And he says, no, no, we, we won't get it. And she's just really taken uh, aback in, in, in a delightful way. She just really likes that he says that and, and truly believes that he loves her. And so a few days down the road after the supermarket, um, th there's, there's another exchange where we actually do see the tension ramp up. Maury wants to go to a show and Cherry says, hey, Maury, can we just not go to the show? Can we, can we just stay home for once. And he puts his foot down and says, no, absolutely not. I've been good that I haven't been giving you these things, um, but we have to go to the show. We absolutely have to go to this show. To which, uh, to, to that point, um, at that point, I should say, uh, Cherry just breaks down into tears and she's very angry and very stressed out. So, so this girl has snapped. And then she starts talking to him about how easier it was um, how how easier a life she had it with with her parents um in in their uh little home their their little simple happy home of five rooms and and Maury responds angrily and he says cherry this is your home now this is your home this is your life with me you have to accept it and and so we're, we're seeing just all these you know ro um, robot servants just giving them stuff and and they're you know listening to a radio drama or they're eating a lot of food or whatever they're in this nice 28 bedroom, or I keep saying bedroom, but uh, 28 room mansion. And um, she just looks, she looks at the mansion. She looks all around her and she says, Maury, I can't stand being poor. So this commences this intrigue where we are 
thinking as 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 the readers like what 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 so wait having a mansion means you're poor and it turns out that is so so having a mansion you're poor um if you have 28 rooms you are poor if you have 42 rooms as we see with another couple later you are poverty level and if you are like cherry's parents with a five-bedroom home you are very, very well off. So how can this be? What's going on where in our world we're thinking, well, no, no, the, the bigger the mansion, the more well off you are. The smaller the home, the more, you, you know, that maybe your income is not so uh, great. <laughs> so, so what's going on here? What, what is the writer Frederick Pohl telling us? Well, he's, he's giving us um, something that we perceive as the opposite of what is true. What, what's going on here? Well, basically, in this society, it's reached to a technical level, like a technologically advanced level, where everything is purely automated, and, and, and everything is done by robots, whether it's robot, robotic servants, um, robotic clerks, uh, staff, um, waiters, waitresses, whatever the case is, and, and not just, you know, service people, you know, the, the positions that we would see, you know, in retail, for instance, the, the, they are robots, of course, but every everything else, you know, um, plant workers, manufacturers, everything, to the point where this automation of, of this robotic world has reached insane levels where everything is outputted in high volumes. So basically, there's a stream of output not stopping by these robots producing a whole ton of things like jewelry like food, like drinks, like alcohol, like, um, like medicine uh, to help you cope in your sleep so you can escape uh, from, from the nonsense. Basically what this nonsense is, is because there's this stream of output with no input, with no intake, there's no natural cycle of things because of this really weird detrimental anomaly, the human race is therefore lawfully obligated to consume as much as possible. And if you do not make your quota, your daily, weekly, monthly quota, you will be obliged to consume even more. So the human race, as it stands, is um, obligated to perpetually consume. So Maury, this protagonist and his new wife, they're in a class three. It's described as class three, where he has a 28-bedroom. I keep saying bedroom. In my mind, I'm thinking bedroom. It's not bedroom. It's, it's a room, a 28-room mansion. Huge, huge house. and and it has a lot of stuff. So the, the bigger the house, the more intake, the more things you have to consume. And you have to consume all day, every day. And it, it, at one point um, in the story, Maury is kind of envious of his wife for able to, you know, kind of sleep it off. Like she can actually sleep through her stress. He actually has developed, because he's so poor over his life, He it's, you know, insinuated that he's, you know, had this problem with insomnia. He can't sleep off his troubles. And so class three, uh, you are at a, in, a, in a poor state where six out of the seven days a week you have to consume day and night all, all throughout. There's one work week, uh, one work day out of the week. You can work out of, out of all the week. You have one day to work and actually be productive. Maury is, I think, an electrical engineer, so he'll make games, he'll make puzzles, He'll, he'll do things that are, are quite mechanical, and he finds real satisfaction out of that because he loves working. That is his reprieve. He's even envious of his boss at, at one point where his boss is, I think, class level seven or something. And, and so he's, he's Spartan. He, he doesn't need so many things in his office. He has, a, he's a, he has a desk that is empty. You know, every other you know, low wage worker has a class, uh, has, has a desk and has an office full of stuff. And this little phone booth, his, his boss, I think, has a little phone booth of an office that has just desk. And Maury doesn't like that. He's very jealous that he, he can choose to be, uh, live as a kind of a Spartan, you know, a Spartan way of life. And Cherry's parents are class eight, where they have a five bedroom home and they don't need a lot of stuff. They, any, anything that is, to be consumed is actually done with, with pleasure or done out of recreation. And um, Cherry's father gets to work five to six days out of the week. He does not need to spend all his, you know, 
waking hours just consuming all the stuff. And so that's where we're seeing the dilemma where Cherry has married to uh, uh, married into a poorer family with Maury. Um, and, and Maury's, you know, he's, he's trying to um, do well and, and take care of his wife. Um, but in, 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 in the plot, he's, he's actually trying to overeat or, um, you know, consume more so she doesn't have to. <laughs> um, and there's no real indication if they're very overweight. I, I think you actually have to play pickleball. You have to just do all these different things all the time. And so to, to us, well, that, that's the opposite of what we perceive as, as poor. You know, for instance, being poor is not having a lot of stuff. And, and then also consuming is done out of pleasure. If we watch a movie, we have chosen to watch that movie. We're not obligated to watch a movie. We're not lawfully obligated to go to an opera. We don't have to go to a museum. In fact, um, Maury, I think, says to two characters at one point or a couple points in the story where he's like, oh, I haven't been to that museum. And, and <laughs> I think it's Cherry's dad who says, oh, son. So and that's kind of embarrassing. So he, because he can't keep up with all the stuff he has to consume. And so that is a really effective way of making the opposite of what is true believable in that it, it's, it's so absurd, but we're really feeling for the protagonist. We're really feeling for Maury. We want him to be better. We want him to have a smaller house. We want him to, you know, downsize because it's like, oh, what? Because if we were put in that position, we would feel very much stressed and anxious to consume day in and day out and only have one day of week to work. Now, it's, it's, it's interesting, too. It kind of, um, I think Frederick Pohl was really uh, trying to warn society about consumerism and materialism going, you know, to the nth degree. And I think he brings up a really good point, too, in that human beings, we also do value work. So in our reality, we would say, oh, I have to work Monday through fi- Friday, you know, eight to five. And, and I'm, at this, I'm stuck at the office. I want to go out. I want to play golf. <laughs> I don't know why that was the first example. And, and, I, and, I, and I think we would say, oh, man, if we had days to just do stuff like consuming, you know, alcohol, for instance, and cake and stuff like that, well, that would be terrific. Well, we're seeing the horf horrifying um that horrifying setting uh in maury's world where it's like no you don't want that you actually do want a highly productive life we are we actually are wired to have a highly productive life we're not we're not wired to consume endlessly we're not we're not supposed to be voracious creatures i mean that that is definitely vice you know that's a um you know gluttony is is a type of vice uh it's you know one of the seven deadly sins and that that, that scares us when we actually see that that is lawfully enforced because of this, this high level of automation by the robots. And so how do you make the opposite? How do you make the absurd or the, the direct opposite of what is true believable? Well, you have to find common ground um, with, with the protagonist and the reader. So um, uh, we, we can uh, – relate to the the protagonist we can relate to more he's like oh consuming is a bad thing if it's at that done at that level at that frightening level and so yeah i would say that is one way to make the opposite of what is true believable and that you're you're rooting for a character you're you're seeing his dilemma you know you're you're seeing like one one scenario for instance is um uh, he's he's with a friend he's with a coworker and in in our world we, we would think it's a very kind gesture of a friend to buy drinks for us or, or around the table, right? That's a, oh, that's a very kind gesture. Thank you for doing that. In their world, it's like, no, 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 I need to buy the drinks. I'm, I'm, I'm behind on my quota for, for alcohol for this month. Let me buy the drinks. Let me buy the drinks. And we, we understand that that is a dilemma. We, we can relate like, yeah, yeah, let him buy the drinks, you know, and then, and people are fighting to, to get their, their little quota stamp saying, no, 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 this, this, one, this round is on me. And the next five rounds are on me too, you know? So um, I find that really fascinating that Frederick Pohl was, was able to do that, able to um, change how we perceive things in the given environment. Now I will say uh, to conclude, uh, the book does and rather optimistically, uh, there are a couple plot holes. They're not really, it's not really 
a big deal. Um, I would give it maybe a three and a half out of five stars. If the, if the plot holes actually um, were answered, I'd give it a five out of five stars. Uh, it's, it is a wonderful read. But yeah, again, um, I hope that gives you some insight, maybe some inspiration on, you know, going with the absurd and then trying to find common ground between, between the, the protagonist and the reader or, or the characters witnessing this like, oh, this is really weird and, and saying, okay, what's the common ground here? Okay, the protagonist hates to consume on this level. I, I can see why that would be a problematic, uh, that, that could be problematic, especially when it's by law, like it's government enforced that you have to consume so voraciously. So anyway, I won't, uh, you know, continue rambling on that, but hopefully you found some, some of this insightful for your fantasy or for your sci-fi. And um, until I see you next, keep producing and preserving the good art and the good literature that you love, and I will catch you later. Thanks.